All right. Well, welcome to our uh, fall legislative preview. As you can uh, see, a pretty casual gathering here on a on a frosty Monday morning. Um, as I said to some that were on and and those that that just joined later, the format will be that we will go around uh, the panel, so to speak, with our senators and representatives, give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, who and what they represent, uh, but really focusing on uh, the work they've accomplished in 2022 and uh, the work they're looking forward to uh, in 2023. So that, that'll take up some good amount of time, but I do think that that gives a really good base level of of knowledge for all of us on the call. I know sometimes in Southern Vermont, we get lost in, uh, in, in you know, we're not as close to the Mecca of, of political power up in Montpelier. So uh, I always find it's really uh, good for them to remind us what we're working on, uh, what has been important to each one of their agendas. Uh, but the second half, we will open up to Q&A. So as you hear things, please write them down. Please have some questions for our senators and representatives. Um, and if they didn't bring up something you're interested in, now is the time. So I want to thank our members for hopping on. As people hop on, I'll continue to let them in. I uh, have with us as well, Erica Floriani, uh, who's who's working at home today. Uh, so welcome, Erica. I know her, her sound has been a little funky, so she's just going to wave there. But I thought we'd kick it off, Brian. As you're taking a sip of coffee, Senator Campion, uh, would you kick us off? Uh, then we'll go over to Senator Sears and we'll go through our representatives after sure. that. And uh, Matt, do you want us to all really focus on economic development stuff? I missed that piece. No, I mean, I think it's good. Uh, you, know, priorities. You, you have a hand in education. What I have found uh, in my seven years now is that everything is interconnected. You know, yeah. we can have a strong chamber without a good education system. We can't have a good education system without a good housing system. Uh, so, I mean, I think there are some key points that that we're often talking about. But I think in yeah. general, um, sure. okay. what, what you're passionate well, with, about. On the, the economic development front, I think everybody's going to probably be talking about this as well. And we talked about it a little bit in Montpelier yesterday when we caucused. You know, this, this, the employee shortage issue is huge. We all face it every day in our other jobs. I see it certainly at the college, not being able to find people um, for... You know, the college right now, for example, is using paper plates uh, in dining services, it can't find dishwashers, uh, short security people, short van drivers, uh, and then also, you know, just, you know, other staff folks. So it's it's a big issue. And, and certainly, as you say, everything is interconnected. Housing is a huge piece of that. And how can we, you know, it's one thing to make an investment in housing that could take five, six, seven years, but we've got to get housing uh, under control. And I know that there are a lot of public-private partnerships that seem to be popping up, which is great. I even think some businesses are really starting to say, all right, how might I house my employees? Uh, so anyhow, I, those two things for sure. The other big theme for me, going back is the mental health crisis that we're dealing with. And I have a particular uh, eye on our schools. I chair Senate education and I am increasingly concerned as we all are and have been for a while. How do we address it? And coming out of COVID, it's particularly acute, not only with kids, but with teachers, how do we help support them? And then related to COVID, you know, the COVID recovery, how do we, you know, everyone's probably seen test scores across the countries, country, ours uh, are also not where they should be. We made a big investment two years ago in literacy, which uh, this was in part, well, uh, in result from low literacy test scores, you know, these were kids who weren't reading and writing at grade level by the time they reached third grade. Once that happens, we know it's, as Matt said, everything is interconnected, hard to get caught up. You might start misbehaving, you get suspended, you get expelled. That puts you possibly more likely into the prison system. <laughs> I mean, education is the root of so much, of course, uh, if not everything in our society from workforce to just being a, being a citizen. So working, continuing to work on literacy, you know, uh, post-COVID kinds of recovery, uh, I'll likely have a, a new, very new committee. Um, the mental health, uh, of course, as we're saying, right across the board. 
And I think those are some of the, the big priorities that I shared with folks yesterday when we caucused. And uh, if anybody has any questions, happy to happy to answer them. Great. Thank you, Senator Campion. Uh, Senator Sears. Yeah. Good morning. And nice to be here. And um, I have to agree with everything Senator Campion said, um, which troubles me deeply, but that's OK. Um, I, but I do want to focus on the mental health. Um, we're in a it's almost embarrassing um, how bad our system is. And I think we really need to focus on not on the entire system. Uh, you know, I hear from the local hospital, the problems that they're having um, at the ER, the problems of the lack of forensic capacity. We've seen it in the Pronto case here in Bennington. Um, we're seeing it all over and it needs to be a number one priority of both the administration and the legislature. I, if we zero in on one particular facet of it, um, we miss uh, some of the opportunities. And we see it, you know, a lot of people who are creating problems in our downtown, for example, are suffering from extreme mental health problems. And so we need to get it. We really need to focus on that. And I believe that that's uh, something we started to put in motion last year, but we need to continue to focus on. Um, the housing issues are critical, but I do think with all the money that we put in last year, we need to start to see how the administration is spending that money. There was an interesting conversation yesterday about we're still, you know, auditing money that was spent on Hurricane Irene. So um, it's going to take a while to make sure that that housing money that we put in last year goes into the right places. And other places that I expect, uh, at least I plan to focus on, is the violence that we're seeing in many communities, Not, and that includes Bennington. Um, we've seen that uptick, um, particularly firearm violence, and uh, I'm working with town leaders as well as uh, the administration and others on a legislation on that. Um, and one other area I would I think is critical to when we talk about workforce shortage and so forth, I've become convinced by many of the, uh, quite frankly, economic leaders in this community that the lack of affordable childcare is a huge impediment in getting people to come here to work and in keeping people working. And so I think that needs to be a focus. We started the groundwork on that, but the tough decision is going to be how do we pay for it? And uh, that will be coming up in the next session. There's a number of other issues always come up. There's always a sleeper issue, one that you don't expect to dominate um, that I'm sure will. But uh, overall, um, I hope to remain as chair of judiciary and uh, a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee. And we'll, we'll be keeping our eye on, on how uh, things go last year when I, I was very happy to see the money go into the pathways program uh, for the homeless and for those that uh, lack housing here we were able to do that in the senate appropriations committee and carry it through the uh, conference committee and so i'm looking forward to other priorities that are important to the people in this area of the state so i guess that's um uh, covers most of what I had to say and be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. I, I'm wondering if if our Southern Caucus starts a pool around what is the sleeper issue of the session, and then Brian can take all your money from you. <laughs> I see you getting ready to talk. Well, I think it's going to be this issue with church and state, honestly, and I'll let yep. uh, the folks from uh, Manchester in particular weigh in on that. But I, I think that's going to be the issue that pops up. Uh, how do we keep agree with dollars? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I should with, have mentioned that, public Brian. institutions. So, but I'm going to let I, Kathleen I think and Seth absolutely right. work on that. Um, it, it affects North Bennington. It affects um, Manchester with Burn Burton. Um, and there were comments yesterday in our Democratic caucus. Um, and it certainly shows a split amongst those who 
would really like to do away with independent schools, quite frankly. Um, and I think it's going to be uh, a contentious issue and um, will really affect um, both the South Shire and the North Shire, obviously with the North Bennington schools and some of our other independent schools. Uh, sure last year, I'll <clears> add, <throat> yeah, Brian, as chair of education, was a leader in uh, passing legislation in the Senate that probably would have uh, solved this problem. But unfortunately, the House chose to not take it up. The short of it is, you know, the Macon decision from the Supreme Court said that public dollars can go to religious schools and we're looking for a way to uh thread a needle that would say okay if they do need to go to religious schools we want to make sure that those schools don't discriminate and so that's largely the the situation there are but as dick just mentioned there are people that would like to say okay we're going to stop funding our burn burtons our village schools we're going to just shut all those schools down and then make sure and that would guarantee that public dollars just go to uh, public schools. But I, for one, feel that would <clears throat> be incredibly disruptive. It's not, you know, we have a, a really great landscape, I think, uh, in this state of independent and public schools that, that seems to work quite well. And so I'm going back, and I think others on this call are going back to see again if we can thread the needle to make sure that doesn't happen. So great. And that's a great segue because uh, Representative James was next on my list. So, uh, Kathy, if you want to if you want to speak to that and, and other things that you're working on this session, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, that is a that is a perfect segue. Um, and Senator Sears and Campion have already brought up the um, issues that I, I think are going to be most important and that we've been putting a lot of time into, uh, which is housing. I'll let Seth speak to that a little bit more um, on our behalf. Childcare, I think um, Dick pretty much nailed it. Um, we've laid the groundwork with a really important bill. A couple of years ago, H-171, and now the question is going to be, you know, how can we get a child care system in place that really serves all families, serves all employers, boosts our economy, um, and how are we going to pay for it? Um, I'm going to be, I assume, returning to the Education Committee and um, the issue of public dollars going to independent schools and mostly to religious schools is going to be huge. Um, I wouldn't even call it a sleeper issue. I, I just think it's going to be massive. And as everybody has explained, it's going to be very controversial. It's going to split caucuses and um, split the legislature along non, non-traditional, or I guess I'd say non-party lines. And we were very disappointed that the House didn't take up um, S-219 last year. It was a bill that would have gone a long way to toward um, solving this problem. I think in an elegant way, um, that solves the problem in a targeted manner. So, you know, instead of uh, sweeping across the board and, you know, feeling like you need to cut off the flow of all public dollars to all independent schools, it's like, you know, taking a sledgehammer to a, anyway, whatever that phrase is. So we're gonna be um, supporting Senator Campion, um, Seth and I certainly strongly in his efforts um, and in the House's efforts to find a solution that ensures that um, any religious schools that are receiving public dollars aren't discriminating and are doing the things they need to do. And I, I really hope that we can settle on that as an answer. Um, so those are three big ones. I, like I said, I, I hope to be returning to the education committee. Um, I have been working a little bit on a bill um, around teacher workforce development, um, maybe some forgivable loans um, to keep to you know, attract and retain teachers um, and just developing some ideas um, that I, I think I'm gonna turn into a draft bill so that we can have a good conversation about how we attract and retain educators um, here in our neck of the woods and across Vermont. So I know we've got a lot of folks that need to go um, in the education committee. Two other issues are gonna be universal school meals. Um, we had that program funded through um, one year, and uh, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, conversation about retaining it, um, and then of course PCBs. So I will leave it at that because I we have a lot of legislators on the call I know who need to share their ideas too. 
everybody's being so polite this morning uh, and quick. This is this is great. We're going to get to some good questions, I think. Um, I do want to get over to Representative Bongarts, but I do want to kind of go slice through the middle as we head up to the North Shire again uh, with Representative Corcoran and Durfee and Whitman. So, uh, uh, Tim, if you want to go, and then we'll head over to uh, Dave. Sure. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Tim Corker and I serve on the House Transportation and hope to be back there again um, there next session. Um, definitely agree what's been said. You know, child care has always been a top priority for me. You, you know, we have to, um, you know, figure out how we're going to pay for that. So that's, you know, definitely on my list. And, you know, agree with housing, you know, just being in real estate business, I can, you know, see firsthand um the the problem that um you know people out there are facing with just the low extremely low inventory and then the cost to actually buy a house is um quite quite daunting for a lot of first time home buyers so those are you know two major issues but another one um you know that we're we're seeing now is the cost of, of fuel i mean it's approaching six dollars a gallon um it's a you know, it's going to be a major issue. I mean, filling up your tank, you're probably talking to, you know, almost $1,500. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure, you know, I think we need to partner obviously with our federal delegation to see if there's some type of way to, you know, not only to help the low income, but, you know, the middle class, um, you know, that's going to be a huge, huge um, burden. Um, and it's going to put a lot of people in, obviously unfortunate situations where they have to decide what they want to do, buy food or heat their house or, you, you know, um, you know, or buy sus prescriptions for themselves. So, um, you know, that's, I, I think it's going to be a, um, a big issue. Um, getting to transportation, um, you know, I, I guess I'll preface this by saying, you know, it's, it's been great to get, um, that we receive so much money um, and, you know, and, but there's a problem when you're, you know, when you're receiving, you know, billions of dollars as far as transportation, you need to match it. Typically, you need an 80-20 match. So the increase that we've been receiving, you know, for this new authorization, the five-year transportation bill that will kick in next year, we're looking at anywhere between, um, I had it written down here, between 109 and $127 million of match money to expend that. Um, and with declining gas um, consumption and our revenues being down, um, and the fact that we haven't had a DMV um, fee bill in seven years, which is good, but you know, there comes a time where you gotta pay the piper, um, you know, how, how how do us as a state do we make that up? And um, you know, so we're going to be looking quite heavily on obviously electric vehicles. You know, how do we recoup some some um, money for, from from that? And um, so that's going to be a you know priority for their committee is how do we not leave any federal dollars on on the bottom line? Um, because you know that wouldn't obviously be good for the state. So I mean, that's our. I think the transportation is probably number one priority is, you know, getting the match, electrifying our um, fleet out there. And um, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that is what I feel is priorities for the, you know, the transportation um, committee and, you know, as, you know, as the legislature. Great. Thank you, Representative Corcoran. I do want to head to Representative Morrissey. I know you're on the call, Mary. So uh, if you just want to, uh, speak to um, your district, and then we'll kind of again move up through through the county. Okay, thank you, like, ma'am. Well, so good morning, morning to some... her members and staff. Just today, right? Is there That's another so conversation <laughs> going on? Yeah, can someone can people mute for now? Uh, go ahead, Mary. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm Representative Mary Morrissey, and for full disclosure, I've been a longtime chamber board of director here in Bennington, the southern Vermont region. And my district in the legislature, I've represented District 2-2 for the past 26 years, which includes uh, included a large part of Bennington. Uh, to the eastern line of Woodford. 
This year, after redistricting, my district is now Bennington District 5, which includes a part of Northern Townall and most of what District 22 formerly was. I have served in my time in office on numerous legislative committees from the past two bienniums on the Money Committee of Institutions and Corrections. And prior to that, I served on the committees of appropriations, health care, government operations, human services, transportation, and general housing and military. As you can see, I have a wide range of experience from the committees I have served on. <clears throat> My top priority issues to work on this session are working on meaningful legislation to make our communities and our state safer from the high rate of crimes being committed due to gang and drug related activities. Um, and also some of the mental health issues that have become stronger within our communities that are relating to some of these issues as well. Public safety is a priority for our communities to be able to attract new citizens, to move and work here, and visitors to come to our beautiful region for tourism, recreation, and to just enjoy what our state and region has to offer. Also, economic development is a priority for our region to be able to attract businesses and companies to locate here that will provide good quality paying jobs for our citizens, but also to attract new citizens by means of college graduates and families to move here. Strong retention initiatives for our businesses to stay vibrant and successful in our communities is also another area we should look at, especially after the COVID issues. Along with economic development, <clears throat> also comes strong policy for workforce development. They need to be interchangeable. Um, we hear it all the time that our businesses are struggling to find the workforce, and we really need to enhance our workforce, especially after the very much change in, in how we did business during COVID. Also, top priorities for me, um, I would like to see a strong review of our tax and regulatory policies as a review, also a, a review to our programs we fund statewide what is working and what is not. I think, you know, appropriations does a, you know, a, a very good job in looking at that, but I think also the committees of jurisdiction need to carefully look at those areas to see where best practice is actually working for, on the topics that we're, we're dealing with and you know, in the different areas. Um, also, always top priorities for me are health care, mental health, treatment beds and initiatives for addiction and mental health, education, uh, affordable child care, uh, proven and reasonable good energy policy, veterans issues, and what our real needs are for housing, especially for workforce housing, which ties in with the economic development. I will also continue to advocate, as I have with Dick, um, for a forensic facility, being that Vermont is only one of three states in the country that does not have one. You know, there are other issues, but I think those are probably my top to start with. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you, Representative Morrissey. We'll go to Representative Durfee. Thanks. Good morning. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'll, I think I'm going to be fairly quick just to make sure that there's time because I, I mean, I really want to hear from the, uh, the chamber members who are here too. Um, I uh, have no idea where I'm going to be uh, in this coming session. The, the landscape has changed or will change dramatically in the legislature. We have a very large turnover with a lot of retirements and uh, a handful of incumbents who were defeated. So um, I have been serving on the Ways and Means Committee for the past couple of years and hoping to be back there, but uh, don't know for sure. Uh, I, I guess I, I'll just mention quickly a couple of things that I've been following. Uh, I'll, I'll say I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Uh, when I was out on the camp, campaign trail and uh, having conversations with, with folks, the, the issue that I would always say was my uh, top top issue in addressing would be child care, dealing with that. Uh, housing all you know obviously ties into that very closely as we've been discussing uh, as far as workforce goes. I'm just looking at an interesting article and maybe uh, Representative Bongart will comment in the in the banner this morning on the front page on a on a, a housing issue that I think really sort of uh, distills the problem of workforce housing for the equinox that was a zoning violation and the, and the hotel was fined. So I mean, I think that's a really great illustration of one of the ways that we, we could be addressing housing is by taking a closer look at our, at our zoning regulations. Uh, I've been, I've been tracking a couple things during the off session. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, a study group. I'm not a part of it, but I've been been following it. That's looking at possibly transitioning the education tax from a property tax to to uh, an income more of an income based tax. We already have a hybrid system. A lot of people do pay on income, um, and there's been uh, a lot of conversation about the the equity, the disparities that causes to lower income people and middle income. Uh, uh, earners as well. The uh, the other issue I've been following, I've been part of a group that's looking at the renewable energy standard that uh, is due to be updated. The uh, uh, <clears throat> the the House barely uh, failed to override a, a veto of the clean heat standard this year, and with with this new House that there are. Uh, considerably more Democrats and progressives in the House than there were this past session. I'm sure the clean heat standard is going to come up again. Uh, it goes to Tim's point about fuel costs. We're, we're way over dependent on the fossil fuel industry. Um, I guess back to my conversations on the campaign trail, the, the issue that I heard more than any was not, not just how am I going to pay for my heating costs, but how are my neighbors going to pay for, for their heating costs? So I think that's something that we're going to have to address in the short term. Uh, but there's the longer term question about just moving, helping Vermonters move off of this, this um, imported, it's a huge drain on, on our state's finances um, to, uh, a, to a, an approach that is more climate friendly. Uh, I, I'll just mention, sorry, I, I'm Dave Derpy uh, from Shaftesbury and represent a larger part of Sunderland now with the new redistricting than I have in the past. Great, thank I'll you. I'll pass it over to whoever's next, yeah. Yeah, Representative yeah. Whitman. Uh, thank you, Matt, and thank you, everybody. We'll see if I can um, give my spiel without getting granola caught in my vocal cords. Um, but uh, so my name is Dane Whitman. I live in North Bennington and represent uh, Bennington District 2-1 along with uh, Tim Corcoran. Um, I was elected uh, first term two years ago. So this is my second term and I hope to return to the uh, Human Services Committee. Just for um, clarification, Dane, it's District 2. There's no dash one anymore. Oh, no more one. Let me, I mean, I'm going to erase that on my, on my notes here, the one. Uh, so uh, I would agree uh, with everybody that um, child care is going to be a top priority, especially in the human services committee. 
Um, two years ago, we put out um, H171, which called for a very thorough study looking at how we could uh, fund a more universal childcare program. That's a, a system that's more affordable for families um, and supports providers, um, supports the workforce of providers, employees, and allows us to expand. So I think in the next couple of months, uh, we expect that study back. And my hope is that it will give us a menu of options that we can really look at. Um, you know, how are we really gonna look at implementing those goals? Um, one thing I'll talk about a little bit more because on human services committee, um, my committee assignment uh, with budget recommendations and things like that has been the Department of Health. Um, and I've been appointed to the um, opioid settlement advisory council. Um, and a lot of my work has been around the uh, opioid epidemic, um, the epidemic of fatal overdoses that we've been seeing over the last two years. Um, 2021 was unfortunately a record breaking year uh, for people having accidental overdose. And that's largely due um, to uh, the introduction of fentanyl, um, a powerful synthetic opioid into the um, drug supply. Um, and I'll say that um, really happy that last year um, we were able to pass $9 million in uh, ongoing investments um, into um, our division of substance use programs. And that included uh, quite a bit of funding for um, substance use prevention programs or prevention partners um, will benefit from that. Um, residential treatment programs and recovery housing um, also received a fund. Looking at um, workforce supports for people in recovery, started a couple pilot programs and I'm really looking forward to seeing how those go. Um, we wanted to kind of evaluate that and something I've felt strongly about for a long time is looking at um, kind of creating paths for um, sort of like therapeutic employment opportunities. Um, also our recovery centers, um, you know, Turning Point uh, is what we have here in Bennington. Um, received a uh, funding increase um, that they were definitely due, um, as well as um, syringe service providers. Um, and happy to hear that um, AIDS Project of Southern Vermont is our current syringe service provider, and they're working really closely with United Counseling Services. Um, I'll also say that um, on the topic of um, mental health um, and treatment, I'm really happy that we were able to support um, our designated agencies like United Counseling Services with a significant um, increase in their reimbursement rate. Um, every year we sort of uh, battle to keep up, um, you know, our mental health workers reimbursement rate with the cost of living, right? So they were, again, do a raise and we were able to raise that um, in large part, thanks to um, Senator Sears's work on the Appropriations Committee and um, everything along those lines. Um, I'll just also say, um, definitely agree that housing is um, really uh, sort of another one of these linchpins where everything goes back to um, housing. Um, also in agreeing with Dick that we put hundreds of millions of dollars into this system. So it's maybe time to really make sure that it's uh, you know, spent effectively. Um, along the lines of housing insecurity and homelessness, I do think a big issue this year is gonna be looking at the federal funds that we've received uh, as the result of COVID um, over the past two years are um, running out. Um, and so our sort of, um, uh, the amount of services that we've been able to provide people to house them in emergency housing has been unprecedented over the last two years. Um, you know, we've been able to ensure people year round um, general assistance, emergency housing. Um, and so I think we're going to be uh, looking at tough decisions about how do we create, um, you know, a strong emergency housing system going forward supporting our local um, shelter capacity, coalition for the homeless. Um, the investment that we saw in pathways is huge. Um, and I think we're hearing from a lot of people that um, 
just affordable housing and having available units for people that are ready to transition is super important. Um, and then I'll just say um, on the uh, point of workforce, like I said, really interested at focusing on programs for people with um, substance use disorder. Um, and I've also been in some conversations with Bennington's local um, workforce uh, group on uh, looking at how the state can support more refugee uh, resettlement um, as an opportunity and um, investing in our career technical education uh, like Southwest Tech. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, everybody. Great, thanks, Dane. And I think our last but not least is uh, Representative Bongartz. I think that that'll uh, kind of round us out. Uh, so please get your questions ready uh, and then we'll kind of do a raise of the hand and I'll put you in a queue uh, so that we got the correct order. But uh, Seth, why don't you uh, finish us out in terms of the panel, uh, in, ter in terms of what you're working on? Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, and boy, it's a... It's a Really wonderful to have Dane sitting on the Human Services Committee uh, and paying the attention he pays to it and uh, how much he helps keep the rest of the delegation informed is, is really fabulous. And, I, and actually, it's really great that we have that uh, from our delegation, we're all sprinkled around different committees so that we can really keep in touch with each other that way. Uh, I serve on the Natural Resources Committee, and I'm also on the uh, committee, the Legislative Rules Committee. Um, and um, Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, which reviews agency regulations as they are put forth. So just so people know that I, that I also serve on that committee. Um, I agree with uh, Dave uh, very, very much about the clean heat standard. Um, it's a huge missed opportunity. It's gonna set us back. The fact that it didn't pass last year sets us back one more year. Um, and you know the requirements of the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act are still there. And the longer we wait, the more compressed the time frame, and the bigger disruption that comes from having to take the steps that we need to take. And and obviously, the um, what we're seeing now with the cost of uh, petroleum products, be it be it heating oil or gas for our cars, is just it's like makes it that much more obvious that we need to take the steps that uh, we should have taken last year. Um, I'm working on uh, a piece of house, some housing legislation right now that I spent I spent the summer working with. Uh, I pulled together a group of people, for, both from the Department of uh, Housing and Community Development, from v, the uh, VHCB Housing Finance, a couple of a uh, few people actually from the regional planning commissions around the state, and VNRC. Um, we're looking specifically, as Dave suggested, at. Uh, what we can do with local zoning regs that often have the uh, effect, and I will say this, I wanna be careful using the term because, uh, but have discriminatory impact on the ability of lower income or moderate income people to live in downtowns where there's access to services. And I wanna make clear that I think that, that those uh, discriminatory effects are usually, in, they're not planned to be discriminatory. They are just the fact of what happens with zoning and especially with zoning that is in many cases 50 years old in different places around the state when the goals were different. Um, so we're looking at how to make it, it's pretty clear if you think about what we want as a state that we wanna have housing as much as possible in concentrated downtowns. That's what uh, provides access to, access to services. You don't need cars in a lot of instances and it also chews up less, less countryside. Um, and um, so, that that's what that's what we're working on is looking at how, how, the kinds of changes we need to make in zoning regulations to make it easier to have dense housing in downtowns, and that really kind of feeds into uh, another I'll call this a sleeper issue, but it's a longer term sleeper issue, and that is that Vermont is Vermont's role as climate haven is going to accelerate dramatically in the in the coming years, and we need to be ready for that. We need to have thought through systemically. Um, as people migrate here, Vermont, by the way, uh, is I think we're going to find it's possible Vermont is the most climate resilient state in the country, um, and as such, uh, we you know we are going to be a climate haven, and that's a there's real opportunity in that if we are um, if we're smart about it, and we funnel the growth that's going to come to the right places. So thinking long term, and long term, you know, isn't that long. 
um, it's over the course of a few years. I just think that's a bit of an issue that people aren't really focused on yet and exactly in, in thinking about it systemically, but we need to be thinking systemically um, about how we turn that ironically global warming into an opportunity as opposed to having it uh, trample us. Um, so housing, childcare, uh, obvious issues, but I wanna go back quickly to the one that uh, we talked about at the beginning, and that's the, um, the what's gonna happen, what the, the challenge faced by independent schools. And that's, a, that's an issue for this county in particular uh, between the North Bennington School and the schools on this end of the county. Um, there's a simple, the simple solution, What's happened is that we have a problem that requires, as, as uh, Senator Campion said, threading the needle, or there's a relatively simple solution available to us, which is just to pass a law that says that um, we won't send dollars to schools that discriminate against any of the protected classes. Pretty simple solution. There are forces that have never liked independent schools. They're using this as an attempt to try to, um, try to damage that system. We know here, the system is kind of a, a really unique mosaic of independent and public schools that works really well and provides great opportunities for our kids. And um, this is, especially on my end of the county, this is kind of a life or death issue. Um, and so the, the simp, what we're gonna simp obviously be advocating for is the, um, is the solution that Senator Campion put in play last year. It'll have to be modified slightly, but S, uh, S219, um, and, you know, the problem is actually even bigger than people realize because we, one, of the pro, one of the issues that will be faced here, if the forces that are really trying to do damage to independent schools are able to do so, is where are these kids going to go to high school? Where are these kids going to go to school? Because Burn Burton is an independent school. Uh, St. Johnsbury Academy is an independent school, and they're going to stay independent. And the question will be, whether uh, the legislature tries to make it impossible for kids to go to them. <laughs> so if they do that, we better be looking at how we're gonna build public high schools as well. Um, so I think though that that kind of chaos is not something the legislature really in the end, I'm hoping is gonna want. And I'm hoping we can find the simple, the simple solution is so obvious and actually so, so relatively simple um, that I hope we can all uh, as a delegation and otherwise as, as uh, stick together and uh, see that see that the work of um, Senator um, Campion uh, is followed through on this time around. Um, one other quick thing to add is well, I've already talked about housing. I think that's, I think I'll just leave it at that. Those are really the, it's, uh, I've been spending a lot of time on housing this summer and obviously the uh, issue with independent schools for uh, from my end of the county is life or death. And um, mm -hmm. we are going to uh, do everything we can to just help the system, help maintain the current system, find the simple solution and move forward. So that's, it. so thank you. Happy, Great. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody, uh, the, the senators and the representatives, very, very thorough. And I think Representative Bongart said it well with uh, just you know, we, we've got a great delegation in various uh, aspects of the government. And so hopefully you brought, you know, your questions and uh, and we can pinpoint them. I know a couple of our representatives and senators have to leave early. Uh, so I know, uh, Kathleen, I think you had to hop off. Uh, Dick, I see your hand up. So uh, as you get your questions ready, I'll go to Dick. And if you have ones, especially for Kathleen, I want to make sure that uh, you get those answered. But we'll go to Dick and then I see Jonah's hand up. Yeah. Very briefly, I just want to make clear that what we have not seen is an uptick in crime. What we've seen is an uptick in violent crime. And people who watch the Albany, New York stations during the campaign obviously believe that crime is, is riding herd on everything. There is no reason to change our work on criminal justice reform. But what is happening, and I think Eric Amati said it best, what we've always had firearms in Vermont. What we're seeing is a willingness to use those firearms. And that's what's changed. And that's what we really need to focus on as a, both a community and so forth. So I really want to make that clear because it's convenient for politicians to use an uptick in crime to change the focus 
and I and I just don't think we should do that. I think we should just focus on the violent crime and what's really happening in our communities. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great, Jonah. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, say a few words, and uh, thank you to all our legislative delegation who are diligently working on these immediate problems of the day. Um, and I guess for my question slash request, uh, I'm going to ask us just for a minute to, to, to break away from the present and think a little bit about the future at the same time remembering our past. And you guys probably know what this is leading up to, which is our 250th anniversaries, which are coming up in just a few short years. Uh, I want to first comment and thank the delegation for the incredible support we've seen here in southwestern Vermont for these anniversary activities, uh, whether it's for Remember Baker this past year that many of you participated with, uh, or the, the Breckenridge standoff uh, last year, or even the, the celebrations we did in 2020 at the height of the COVID pandemic. Uh, what that's culminating here in Bennington County is a, a dramatic effort to do this planning work for the 2025 through 2027 uh, time period. Uh, and just so people out there know, that's really starting with the anniversary of the capture of Fort Ticonderoga, then the next year, the Federal Declaration of Independence, and then finally in 2027, the founding of Vermont, and of course, the battles of Hubbardton and Bennington. A lot of work has been going on locally. Many of you have been seeing those emails. Uh, if you're wondering uh, what you could do, we, uh, at least in Bennington County, please do reach out to me. But I wanted to say at the same time, we're seeing a lot of ground being made locally. Uh, one of the things we're looking forward to doing is coordinating and working with our state 250th commission, uh, which has been working also since about 2020. There will be a legislative ask uh, this coming session for funding for that 250th commission effort. And I would like to encourage our legislative delegation to look at that very carefully and hopefully support uh, putting money towards those celebrations as we have done in the past. So sorry for that long-winded observation, but that is my request. And thank you all so much for providing this opportunity. Great, thanks, Jonah. Anybody wanna comment on that effort so far or future efforts for that? May I, I'll just come and I have indicated to, that I'm hoping that the governor will add into his um, budget re, um, budget plan for the coming year, some funding for the 250 uh, commission for this project. So I'm hoping that he will, but I know appropriations will probably also be dealing with it. But I did, um, you know, put in a request on behalf of all of us that there would be some funding coming forward as there was when the 250th Commission launched, there was money put towards it and it needs to have some funding each year. Okay, thank you, Representative Morrissey. Uh, Tortoise, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, I am so grateful and impressed and proud that we have such a strong uh, Bennington County representation in Montpelier, as we do also from v Vermont in Washington. Uh, and the two things that came to my mind are both related, uh, are related to both crime and media. And on the crime side, the fact that the community uh, policing advisory and review board that the Bennington Select Board established, finished its training, uh, has had one public access meeting and there'll be the second one. They're the third Thursday of the month and it'll be coming up th this coming Thursday. Um, but on, on that, the, the advisory part is still in a bit in limbo uh, as it is aware that there is a possibility of legislative action to permit the, the oversight boards that not only Bennington, but other towns in, in Vermont have established to actually play that role. So uh, that's something that, that, that I know many are in, eager 
to have encouraged. Um, and now I'll just say the second piece of it, which relates to the media, which is that we are very fortunate to have the Bennington Banner and GNAT TV and other local sources. And that I just learned about the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act that is coming up as a possibility to be, ref to be funded in Washington. And so my question there is, this is a way that we can encourage our uh, representatives to take matters up to Montpelier. What kind of a role does the legislature play in order to give their support behind, for instance, the that uh, Journalism Competition and Preservation Act, since in Vermont especially, you know, the small uh, uh, media uh, and Vermont Digger and Seven Days and a few of those, you know, can, can use that kind of support. So that sort of comment and question also. Great, thanks Torres. And we should mention uh, and, and thank Cat TV uh, when they saw that we were putting this together, they oh, yeah. asked to hop on. Uh, and so they are recording this. We're recording it as well, but I know they will showcase it as they do uh, daily uh, with a lot of things that are going on. And, and GNAT as well do do a terrific job. Uh, Senator Sears, I see your hand. Yeah, up. I just, just wanted to comment on Tortoise's first issue with the police commission. I've actually in, uh, uh, a drafting request in for legislation that would allow towns and cities to create their uh, police commission uh, either way. It would be up to the select board or the whatever the town government is. Um, as you know, Vermont's a Dillon rule state. And so currently it would take a charter change to allow that. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, it's a split issue in this community. And I don't know what would happen if this legislation passes, but it's at least would be enabling legislation to allow the towns to make that choice. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Tortoise. And, and I appreciate you bringing up the, the media piece, you know, uh, as uh, I think we're a firm believer, I'm a firm believer in professional journalism, uh, and and I think we've all witnessed when uh, when there isn't enough of that journalism, be that through uh, you know TV or or print or anything like that. We have uh, community activists that that get uh, that get showcased uh, on their platforms, uh, thinking that they're that they're providing a service. Uh, so I think it's a very um, we're in dangerous times for sure for local uh, media and, and even I would say national journalism. Um, so if people want to uh, comment on that as well, and I see uh, Representative James, your hand is up, so I'll let you go. Um, yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I, I just wanted to comment that I, I spent most of my career in journalism. So this is really this is an issue that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, and I know that our PEG um, channels around the state are going to be coming to the legislature with some requests this year. Um, I think it's very, very important that we continue to provide funding um, to, you know, the GNATs and the CAT TVs um, all around Vermont that are doing, I think, such an amazing job of educating voters, um, making sure that people are getting facts instead of fiction. Um, and providing actual community journalism. I I just, I think it is vital to the future of our democracy. I, I get very passionate about this issue. And um, I've been starting to do a little bit of preliminary work um, on the issue of media literacy. And I'm not sure that anything will come of it, but um, I'm gonna be visiting some of our uh, schools in the, over the next couple of weeks to see how they teach our kids um, essentially to assess the quality of sources that they see on the internet, to assess the quality of information, to be able to tell fact from fiction, to know when they're looking at a conspiracy theory, uh, you know, over, over actual um, sort of actionable information. And I, I don't know whether a bill will come out of it or not, but it's something I'm really taking a look at and have set up a meeting with AOE to learn a little bit more about our uh, Vermont's educational standards and what they have th to say about how we teach our kids um, basically to assess the quality of information that they're seeing. And I just see our, our local newspapers and our um, PEG TV stations playing a huge and very important role. So hope everybody will be on board with, with full funding um, 
and whatever those stations need to stay alive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kelly, I see your hand up. Good morning. Thank you everybody for giving us updates. My head is spinning right now, listening to all that you have to do this year. There's so much going on. Um, I guess before um, Mr. Sears leaves this morning and the conversation that just happened, I, I didn't come on with the intention of talking about the law enforcement piece, but um, it did, the committee, the commissions that have been set up, if there is conversation, I, I hope that we're, we're bringing it more of a unified uh, look at things versus just towns. I, these officers are coming out of an academy with training. Um, so there should be some kind of connection to the academy piece of this as far as um, are we all coming forth with the same plan um, so that we can disperse into our communities in, this, in the same, same way. And I, I not, like I said, I didn't come prepared to have that conversation, but it came on, but it's something that I, as I've watched um, all the dialogue that's been happening the last few years, um, that I felt that I don't hear much about how that's all working together with the training um, academy at the same time. So that that was one thing that I, go ahead. Do you want to respond? Oh, oh sorry, Kel. I was just wondering, I, I missed part of it. You were in and out. So were you? are you wondering about how we train police officers? And I apologize. No, I'm not wondering. I have one as a son. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how the commissions are working together with the academy. Um, yep. yeah, oh, I see. That we're as, as versus just sitting in town. So if you're if you're going to give consider more authority to the commissions in the towns, then how are you working together to understand the training at the academy level and, and it. how it's going to work together to disperse into these philosophies into our communities um, there? Because that that's a long training session to come out and then work with a commission on a different mission. So I I, I just want that to make sure those things. I are just feel that to jump that far that there's a lot more work needs to be done to have a general, I'm not yep. looking, I don't know that I have all the right words. And then the other piece is I, I um, Bennington has had, uh, the whole Southern part of the state has had a lot of momentum going on in the business world. Um, and, you know, we, there are so many challenges that everybody's dealing with, with the workforce piece of it. Um, but uh, this fuel um, costs that are going up and how it's going to impact everybody's pockets. Um, so everybody's going to pay more for fuel, and and then that means that maybe people will have their discretionary spending will change uh, habits. So um, I just, you know, I think that when we go and we talk about who needs help, I think that we need to look across the board um, as to how we can disperse that kind of help for everybody and how it will impact them um, directly and indirectly. So that, that was one piece. And then lastly, I, I, uh, from the workforce piece of everything, that, which is kind of what my, um, the drug epidemic that's going on, that was why I came on this morning. And I'm so, I was so happy to hear um, what Dane, all the work that you're doing, because I, um, I didn't realize all that was happening. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that information. But I, I think that when we look at all the challenges, mental health, workforce, I think that the drug epidemic piece of things that is going on is a big impact in our community. Um, I think that we, I know that when I travel the roads in the community that I've lived in my whole life and, and brought up two children, um, I can see how many people are being impacted, how many families are um, being challenged, but at the same time, how many children that my kids went to school with that are not in the workforce for so many reasons around the drug epidemic. So I, I think that that is something that we have to keep looking for that mental health, those training programs, um, those people, places and things that they're challenged with all the time when they're in recovery, how we expand on that so that we can have more success um, in that. That's what I joined in for, but I just wanted to make sure we talked about the law enforcement piece before <laughs> the representative C Sears left. Do people wanna comment on some of Kelly's comments? <laughs> So have we worked with the academy at all to, in any of these commission groups? Yeah, that's a great question. That I, you know, oh, there's Dick now. Maybe he can answer that. But we we do work with the academy. A lot of changes have taken place, as you know, with the Terminal Justice Training Council, and it's another area of uh, oversight. Um, it's mainly been under the Government Operations Committee and the Senate, but um, this. Uh, in the Appropriations Committee, we've been working with Bill Sorrell, who's former Attorney General, who is the chair of the 
commission and others um, and trying to get things up to speed. I think it's important um, to recognize that a lot of changes in law enforcement and practices for the better are coming. Um, and there's no denying that we're, as Dane has mentioned and others, an unprecedented opiate epidemic that's, um, you know, fueling a lot of things. And it's, um, my dog's are gonna start barking because um, somebody's coming to the door, but I'll try to get everything in before he does. And that, that but the main point I would, would leave it with is that, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we can't compete with the dog. Um, we're, we're making every effort to get this taken care of as soon as possible. Senator Sears, I know you had some comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, and really appreciate um, uh, the priority given to um, this issue by so many people on the call. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, what I briefly mentioned, um, the Opioid Settlement Advisory um, Council, which was established by the legislature um, last year, has had its sort of initial meetings of the summer. And basically what it's looking at is um, the legal settlements that were a recognition that part of the opioid epidemic that we're dealing with is the fact that pharmaceutical companies um, were not um, completely forward with the um, addictive nature of um, you know, pharmaceutical painkillers, opioids, and things like that. So, so many people really are um, victims of um, a system that uh, pushed out these um, pharmaceuticals. And uh, the result of those legal settlements um, with multiple um, manufacturers, distributors, um, has been um, millions of dollars per year um, that can now be um, appropriated towards uh, treatment, prevention, um, other sorts of tools. So um, we're meeting every month. It is um, chaired by Commissioner Levine and the Department of Health. Um, we have members on it from the treatment community, recovery community, people with a direct lived experience. Um, the League of Cities and Towns has a number of folks on this committee. And basically it's a way of bringing everybody to the table and uh, creating recommendations on how to spend uh, these settlement dollars. Um, I am sitting on the committee myself, and um, I would just um, encourage you to keep an eye out on our progress um, as more and more settlements gets, uh, you know, finalized. It's um, looking at, you know, minimum of $3 million a year, but that's before things like Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family, uh, you know, so we're um, basically the, the, um, the silver lining of all of this is that we can start to think about how to invest in our communities to begin correcting some of the harm that's been done. Um, and I would just really encourage everybody to stay tuned to that work and provide feedback um, to me, um, to Dick on appropriations um, as we continue to find the best ways to um, provide resources. Great, thank you, Dane. Other questions. It's about 9.10, so we've got a little bit more time if you want it, although I know some of our, our delegation did have to hop off. Um, but any other questions? Uh, you know, I'll always put in a plug for, you know, I think the two uh, issues that we run into most with the chamber or that I hear the most about would be around uh, travel and tourism dollars. Uh, that is often uh, uh, something that gets brought up. Um, as that, that tends to be some of the backbone of our economy, especially when it comes to, to merchants and retailers and restaurants and, and lodging. Um, but that is usually uh, uh, low funded uh, in terms of, of, of its competitors at Maine and New Hampshire and their marketing dollars. So I'm, I'm always putting a plug in there. You know, I think the thing that's been, and, and it's been mentioned a lot today is around workforce. Uh, and and retention recruitment and and I I often think those being two different things uh, you know being able to bring people in I know uh, Dana mentioned uh, kind of the the new American and and refugees and and be, having a maybe a a nice little um, 
you know, spotlight there uh, in term, uh, and even bring people in from all over uh, the country. Maybe, like Seth said, some of that uh, uh, climate safe harbor uh, will be bring people in, but it's also about creating a Vermont that they want to stay in as well. And I know that we work hard at the chamber for that. We also work hard at the Shires Young Professionals for that. And I know we don't uh, have a rep on for that, so I'll, I'll rep it <laughs> for the meantime. But, you know, part of the effort around Shires Young Professionals is is um, is not just bringing people to Vermont, but making sure that Vermont is a welcoming state as well and, and a dynamic state where uh, they can get all that they need, fiber, cell phone service, uh, healthcare, schooling, uh, so I know that uh, Beth Wallace, who's our chair at, at Young Professionals, would be would be echoing those statements as well. Uh, so those are the two that I'll want to put in uh, just into the the ear of our our delegation. Anybody else? I've stalled enough. So if you did have one final question, uh, you'd be able to raise your hand. Um, but not seeing any. Uh, we'll get people on to their day. This has been really great. We want to thank all our senators and representatives. Uh, you know. We, we mention this each time. They're very approachable, as you can uh, see. So uh, if, if you know, you didn't think of a question today or something as you're thinking of it through the day, I know each one of these, uh, these uh, senators and representatives on the call would gladly take an email, gladly take a call. Uh, they're passionate about what they do. I, I, I echo Taurus where I think we've got a really great delegation and we're very proud of, of the work that they're doing um, in these very chaotic times. So with that, I want to thank uh, our senators, representatives, and our members for hopping on this early morning. Uh, and and let's get let's all get back to work. Thanks, everybody.